thanks all for giving me the opportunity to talk to you this afternoon. I appreciate like this is the time when people want to be going home and not necessarily coming to a talk. So I really appreciate you coming and giving me uh, um, the opportunity to to tell you about some of the, the research that I've done. Um, and also thank you to uh, the Implementation and Improvement Group and the um, Clark South for inviting me to come talk today. So. What I want to do is share some of the insights that I've gained through research and the relationship between obesity, inequality and health. So you should all have a copy of the evidence-based comic that I created with the artist Jade Sarsom. So I was actually, um, this uh, lecture was written for, I got given the Margaret Mead Award lecture for social sciences by the British Science Association. And so this uh, lecture was written for the British Science Festival, so it's uh, written for a public audience, but I find that that works. I imagine in, in the room here we probably have people from all different disciplines, so if you are a psychologist, don't worry, you will be able to understand this because it is pitched pitch at a public audience. Um, so what the, the, the lecture was named after like the pioneering uh, anthropologist Margaret Mead, so it seemed appropriate to start the lecture with uh, some of her own words to help uh, explain why I chose to communicate my research in the form of a comic. Um, so she, oh by the way, you know when you've made it when you've got your face on stamp, don't you? Like that, like if you're an academic and you've got your face on stamp, you've done well. So yeah, she said, if one cannot state a matter as, uh, clearly enough so that even an intelligent 12 year old can understand it, one should remain within the cloistered walls of the university and laboratory until one gets a better grasp of one's subject. So what I'm hoping to convince you by the end of today is first, yeah, that they were right to let me out. Um, so as well as being a, a researcher, I've, I also co-founded an art collective called AWL, or Act With Love, to give it its full name. Uh, we work collaboratively with artists and designers uh, to make scientific evidence accessible and engaging for as wide as an audience as possible. So the Weight of Expectation comic is one example of the work that we do. So here is our uh, act with love. Um, but it's also part of a much broader series of work uh, which we've called the Picturing a Thesis Project. And what we're attempting to do in this project is to steal an 80,000 word thesis into a series of artworks. Now this is partly to save people the trouble of reading what is otherwise a perfectly serviceable doorstop, um, but it's mainly to convince people of the arguments within that thesis. Um, and so I'll use artworks throughout the, the time I have with you this afternoon to illustrate my argument, uh, which is this. The way that we currently approach the issue uh, of obesity is unfair, ineffective, and needs to change. And uh, let me explain why. So due to scientific and social progress, the threat of infectious disease is much less severe than it used to be. Now the vast majority of deaths um, are caused by non-communicable diseases, so... Uh, for those not familiar with this term, these are diseases that can't be passed from one person to the next through the spread of germs. For example, cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, mental health conditions. So naturally, the focus in public health has shifted uh, to treating and preventing non-communicable diseases. Obesity is often spoken about as one of the biggest th threats to public health. Uh, this is because it's of its association with non-communicable diseases. Despite being neither a disease itself nor infectious, uh, we talk about an obesity epidemic, placing a huge burden on the National Health Service. Now, this is interesting because, obviously, epidemics more generally, the, the, the meaning of that word is to spread germs across a, at a level. So it is interesting to think about why we refer to the obesity epidemic when we perhaps wouldn't refer to that in other conditions. Um, so it is now estimated that it costs the NHS over £6 billion a year um, f to, to deal with uh, obesity and also conditions related to being overweight. Now, before I start my talk proper, let me clarify a few things. Uh, I do not deny that in recent decades there has been a significant increase in the number of people who are classified as overweight or obese. Neither do I deny that there is a strong association between obesity and non-communicable diseases. In fact, recognising these realities uh, is one of the main reasons why I argue our approach to obesity needs to change. Um, there are many reasons to be critical of the way obesity is currently framed and understood and the ways that governments tend to try and reduce it. In short, 
what I'm arguing is that although obesity is often framed as the biggest threat to public health, what I'm arguing is that the biggest threat to public health is how we deal with the issue of obesity. I'll explain why this is the case and show you that a better approach is not only possible but necessary if we're going to do something about this. So to start with then, obesity is a very crude indicator of health. I'm sure many of you in the room already uh, appreciate this. So the BMI scale is what makes obesity possible. It was originally developed by the military um, in order to measure population averages to inform their recruitment strategies. Um, it was later taken up by, ins by insurance companies as their research showed that there was an association between high body weight and mortality. Though, of course, they were more concerned about increasing profit than they were about promoting health. Uh, within the scientific community, researchers have always disagreed about how useful and accurate uh, the BMI scale is. It was not chosen because it was the most accurate, uh, effective or accurate measure of health, but because public health departments needed a standard, uh, a standard measurement um, and something that was cheap and easy to administer so that they could begin to chart the incidence of obesity. Uh, so the BMI scale was chosen as a way of measuring our health for pragmatic rather than scientific reasons. Within the scientific com uh, community, one of the main criticisms of BMI is that the categories are misleading. So it creates a sense that there is a safe zone and a series of unsafe zones either side of that. But what is actually, um, what actually comes it about with the BMI is that risk of disease is far more a scale, right? So if we take uh, an example here. So a person uh, here at this part of the, say, healthy weight category will have far more in common with someone who is just here on the overweight category than they will someone in the middle of this healthy weight category. But one of those people, if they go to the doctors and they're measured, will be told that they're unhealthy and that they need to change their lifestyle and change the ways that they act in a whole series of ways. And the other one will be told that they're not and that, that, that they're fine to carry on as they are. And yet they share an almost identical risk factor. The difference between those two people could be as little as 0 0.1 kilograms, right? And yet one is put into a safe zone and one is put into an unsafe zone. Um, and in fact, there's been so much disagreement about the accuracy of these categories that in the past they have changed. So in 1998, the overweight threshold was lowered to 25, a BMI of 25, um, which meant that one night in America, 30 million people went to bed healthy and woke up unhealthy or overweight, however you want to look at it in that way. So obviously this is, a, this is an issue, but the biggest problem with the BMI scale is that it's created the belief that the relationship between weight and health is a clear and obvious one. This has established the idea that a healthy obese person is a contradiction in terms. You can't be fat and healthy, everyone knows that. We've created a culture where if you claim that somebody can be fat and healthy, and I should point out at this point, when I say fat, I'm using it in the sense of a capital F identity sense of fat not in a derogatory sense, that, yeah, if you claim somebody can be fat and healthy, kids will laugh at you um, because of your stupidity, and adults will accuse you of being irresponsible. The problem with this is that the science isn't actually on their side. So there's lots of evidence of what has been termed uh, obesity paradoxes. Obesity paradoxes are examples where people are both obese and healthy. It's worth noting that they're only considered paradoxes because of the idea that you cannot be healthy and obese. They're not a traditional paradox in the sense that you can't really understand this in conventional terms. Um, now, there's a few of these paradoxes, and, uh, but I'll focus on three examples of you uh, for you today. So I'll start with the, the well-known one. Uh, I reckon everyone in this room will know it. Most of the, uh, of the general public know it. We might call it the muscle fat fallacy or the sports person uh, fallacy, which is that People, you know, uh, people who take part in sports where you acquire a lot of muscle, so like uh, rowers or uh, rugby players, will almost always be categorised as obese because the BMI scale isn't sophisticated enough to differentiate between mass of fat and mass of muscle. So they'll just be like uh, judged on their mass, which means, yeah, you have these people who we would otherwise consider to be healthy in, in a series of ways, and yet they would be considered to be obese. So for some people, that's enough for them to go, well, 
it's a ridiculous scale then because these people are clearly healthy and this doesn't work. That's the most well-known paradox. The other one, there's another one that would, we would which refer to in the literature is like the classic obesity paradox. And this is where obesity is protective in a chronic disease state. So it came from a, an experiment where people had had heart surgery and the hypothesis was that people who were a healthy weight would recover better from that uh, surgery and that there would be less complications and people who were overweight or obese would have more complications and have lower rates of survival. And what they actually found was the exact opposite of that, that there was seemed to be a pr protective state for people who were overweight and obese. And, these, and this has been shown to be the case in, in a number of issues, but it's not an un uncontroversial one. There are studies that would suggest that it doesn't always play out. But the obesity paradox that I want to focus on uh, with you today, because it's particularly relevant to the work that I do, is what's colloquially known as the fat but fit sort of category. So in the literature it's called people being metabolically healthy but obese. And the fat but fit uh, category is where people who uh, are physically active and uh, obese have been shown to have equivalent levels of metabolic health as people who are of a healthy weight and uh, physically active. So if you think about it, this comes from studies and studies where, like we're talking big sample sizes, where you've got lots of people who are obese and yet some of them have healthy uh, metabolic states and others don't. So these are seemingly, they're all the same in that they're all obese. So how do we understand as scientists why some of them are healthy and some of them are unhealthy? So in the studies, they started to look at different variables and one of the variables they looked at was physical activity. And they found that if people were overweight or obese and physically active, that this transformed obesity to sort of being in a benign state, really, that it, it didn't have this health impact on, um, on people that would otherwise be expected and is associated with obesity. So what this tells us is that physical activity seems to be a far more reliable indicator of health than obesity. Um, and this is incredibly important for two main reasons. One it should lead us to ask one of the most fundamental questions in science. That is the question of correlation or causation. So let me explain. Now, it's a popular uh, belief and one that I'm benefiting from personally right now is that people who wear glasses are intelligent, right? So now this is a classic example of correlation uh, rather than causation. For instance, I could give my glasses to anyone and it, they wouldn't acquire the knowledge that I do or don't have. Do you know what I mean? So this is, this is a classic instance that the glasses don't make me clever, but lots of clever people seem to wear glasses, and so therefore the, there's a correlation. But it isn't a causation, right? Um, so in the context of obesity, if someone can be both obese and healthy, we have to ask, does obesity cause ill health, or is it just correlated with it? Um, is it actually inactivity rather than obesity that is the cause of these non-communicable diseases? The evidence would suggest that it is in, a, in a lot of health measures that this, this might be the case. Now, the second uh, reason is related to this. So if someone can be healthy and obese as long as they're physically active, then our cultural obsession with weight loss cannot be justified on health grounds. So the evidence shows that almost all successful attempts to lose weight are short-term, People lose weight and then they gradually put it back on again. Vast swathes of our, of our society are stuck in a cycle of yo-yo dieting, which is you know, known within the scientific literature as weight cycling. And the evidence suggests that this off-on, on-off, off, on-on, off-off, on-on sort of cycle that just goes round and round is actually bad to your health compared with maintaining a relatively stable weight, even if that happens to be overweight or underweight. Um, so instead, um, but we don't just look at this and we think and think that that's that's problematic. We could, though, instead do away with this contemporary tradition and focus on supporting people of all weights and sizes to be physically active. That's what the evidence would seem to be suggesting would be the logical thing to do. So then, the solution, uh, and I think I'm coming up to maybe 40 minutes, is to tell people that. BMI, um, that we shouldn't worry about BMI and that instead we should focus on being physically active. Um, well, almost, but not quite, and here's why. So lifestyle modification is said to be both the cause and cure of obesity. 
the idea being that modern societies changed everyday life in ways that promote weight gain. Despite recognition of the social drivers, prevention strategies currently approach obesity as the outcome of personal choice and willpower. This is well illustrated by our national public health campaign, Change for Life. You all have all seen this slogan. If, if any of you have managed to live in the last 10 years and missed this slogan, I need to recruit you for some research because that's <laughs> incredibly impressive. Now, just l let me unpack this a bit for you. So this, this slogan, eat well, move more, live longer. And by the way, th this has been changed from the original. The original was eat less, move more, and live longer. Um, they were challenged by a series of people who are obviously have interest in and uh, vested interest in looking at uh, eating disorders and the idea of promoting eating less is problematic. But still this idea of move more, if you think about this move more, it assumes already that you don't move enough, right? So this is telling everyone we need to move more, um, even though that might be problematic. But what the, the biggest issue here is that there is this, again, like I said, there's this really simplistic solution to this very complex issue. Just eat well, move more, and you'll live longer. Um, now, there is truth in the slogan. In fact, you could even say it's common sense. I wouldn't necessarily disagree with the idea that if you eat things which we consider to be healthy, so for instance, have a high intake of uh, fruit and vegetables, if you do uh, physical activity, if you're physically active, um, you'll, the science does demonstrate that you'll probably live longer than someone who doesn't do that. Um, but there is a problem with that. So, and the problem is, for me, basically. So this makes my job as a social scientist very difficult because if you argue against what's considered common sense, you just seem to be cynical and unhelpful. You're part of the problem and not the solution. And this is actually a particularly important issue in the context of this talk. If you're thinking about implementation and improvement, like if, you, if, if the solutions that you're given or if the, your arguments seem counter-logical, then you're unlikely to get an audience, particularly not an, a, a public one. Now, the best way that I've found to combat this is to take on common sense with common sense. So here's one uh, uh, poster that we created as AWL. So what you're seeing on your left here is an, a genuine Change for Life uh, campaign poster. And what you're seeing on your right is a poster that, we, that was inspired by this that came out of one of the Picturing a Thesis projects. Um, and let me unpack this for you, because what this poster here, the genuine one, is doing is something that's quite subtle, actually. Although it's brutal in its application, in, in that it's separating all of society into two groups of people, essentially. So, hands up who wants our kids, long, uh, to, our kids to live longer. Who says no to that, right? Nobody, nobody says no to that, right? So, straight away you've got you're a good citizen, you live a healthy lifestyle, and you want your children to live a healthy lifestyle, and you'll support your children to live a healthy lifestyle. And if you don't do that, you're obviously a bad citizen that wants children to die before their parents. Like, subtle, but there, right? But what it's doing on a, on a, on a, on a bigger scale than that is it's moralising the condition. It, it's, it's injecting the issue with a morality because it's, it's about the individuals, about, look, we have a choice. We either want our kids to live longer or we don't. And if we want them to live longer, we, we comply with these, these sets of standards because it's just about making choice about whether we do that or not. What the uh, R poster is doing is sort of <laughs> using a really simplistic sociological analysis to demonstrate that people don't just make these uh, free choices, that f f choice isn't freely made and that actually there are social drivers to how people behave. Now, I should add that it was the artist's um, choice to put poverty in there. I wouldn't necessarily have just put poverty in there. I think that the idea that obesity is just an issue of poverty is, is problematic. If we got rid of poverty, there would still be obesity. There is a sliding scale, as I'll go on to say, that we can talk about inequality and we can talk about deprivation here. We don't just have to go to the extreme of poverty. But what it is illustrating to you is, that, yeah, what does that person feel like there? If, if the, the idea is it's being presented as this individual choice, you either want your kids to live longer or not, and uh, if you can't provide them with that healthy lifestyle, or if the culture around you doesn't support that, what does that position that person as? Um, 
and it, it completely moralizes the issue. So the Change for Life campaign places all the emphasis on personal choice and individual responsibility. And it's important to note that that was a social marketing campaign. It cost about 20 million pounds to do. All it was ever supposed to do was essentially be advertising, telling you to do this, telling you that if you eat well and move more, you'll live longer. It's just information. It's not designed to change anything, um, unless obviously education leads to change, which we've got <laughs> years and years of evidence to show that that isn't uh, always the case. It's a necessary requirement, but not one that's sufficient. Now, this casts anyone who is overweight and obese as, as an irresponsible person placing an avoidable burden on the NHS, and that's really important, the avoidable part. That's how the morality comes into it, that this is an avoidable thing. If only people made different decisions, then we wouldn't have this £6 billion drain on the NHS. And obviously the NHS now is it's the, the crown, it's the jewel in the crown, isn't it? It's the thing that we can use to moralise anything. It's the, it's the thing that we can now blame Brexit on. It's the thing that we can, any politician that wants to come in. It's why we celebrated the 70th anniversary of the... No one celebrates 70. Like, that's not the thing. It's 75, isn't it? But, but the problem is that, you know, the, the people in power had a particular issue, so they thought, well, let's make this birthday really significant, as if it was the 75th birthday. Um, it's become the thing that either saves you or, or is the, the noose around your neck, the NHS. Um, and that is used very effectively in the stigmatisation of, uh, of obesity and overweight. Um, so, in essence, what the campaign does is it uses stigma as a strategy to promote weight loss. Now, if we lived in a society where a healthy lifestyle was freely accessible and a, and a realistic option for all, then this strategy may be effective. But we don't. How do I know this? Because of all of the em evidence demonstrating that, the link between, um, that there is a strong link between inequality and obesity. For instance, only uh, a couple of months ago, um, the Food Foundation indicated that over 4 million households, that's households, not individuals, 4 million households in Britain were unable to afford to follow the government recommendations for healthy eating. And let me put that into context. 14 million, ha uh, 14 million households, let's say that a minimum of two people lived in that, ho in that household, 28 million people, that is half the country. And if we go back before and we think about change for life, the first bit is eat well. How do you eat well? Follow government guidelines. Half the country are not able to afford to follow the guidelines that the government are putting, which really highlights the sort of lunacy of providing a social marketing campaign to try and resolve the issue of obesity. Um, so, yeah, that's some context. And this is where an appreciation of social context is key. We live in one of the most unequal societies in the world. Professor Danny Dorling recently described uh, or declared the scandal of our times as the biggest gap in life expectancy recorded in Britain since the recession of the 1880s. And in this he was referring to the 14.4 years difference in life expectancy between the relatively deprived or very deprived uh, city of Glasgow and the affluent borough of Kensington and Chelsea. Um, now, because I wrote this talk for the British Science Festival, it seemed appropriate to mention that 150 years ago, when that was last the case, uh, Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch had only just established germ theory. So to put that into context, like previous to germ theory, we thought that disease created germs, right? So we thought that when people got sick, they created germs, not that germs created, uh, made people be sick. That's how primitive we were in our science about public health. And that's the, the position where people were the last time we had this difference in life expectancy. And yet, for all of the progress that we've made, we've still got an equivalent gap in life expectancy. Um, so for all the scientific and medical advances we've made since, uh, since then, health inequalities persist. And this is because health is largely socially determined. Almost all the ways we measure health follow what uh, we call a social gradient, sometimes referred to as the health wealth gradient. Um, and here's what a health, gra uh, health gradient looks like. So you can hear, see here, this is for life expectancy, whether it's problematic or not, that's often the marker that we, that we use. So uh, least people living in least deprived areas of England and Wales, people living in most deprived, uh, and you can see uh, life expectancy up there. And what you're seeing there is that linear relationship. That, and it, and it's, what's really remarkable as a social scientist, it's, it's difficult for a social scientist to look at this because 
one, it, it so beautifully proves your point that, you've, that you're happy, but it's such a depressing thing to look at that you can't be happy, right? But it, there's, it shows that real clear relationship. It's like a set of stairs, you know? As you, as you go down that, that socioeconomic scale, your life expectancy reduces. Um, and the thing is, obesity, diet, physical activity all follow these social gradients. And here's one example for you. So here are um, stats provided by the government through the obesity, uh, the National Child Measurement Programme, which itself is problematic for a number of reasons, but let's go with the evidence that they've given us. And again, you can see so similar thing, least deprived areas, most deprived areas. And you can see those um, children in reception and in year six. So I think that that's, it's quite interesting to look at and compare those as well. So clearly in the least deprived areas, you have fewer percentage of, uh, of the population, of the child population who are o over uh, obese. And then at the other end, far, far more. And what I think is really interesting in this, actually, is that the gaps are relatively uh, are smaller. They seem to be smaller at... at uh, at a, a younger age, but then you really see as people get older and they live that reality, they get bigger, and this, that, that we, can, we can see that there are, the instance of obesity goes up. And also what I, one of the things I think is really uh, interesting to point out is that in the most deprived area in year six, you've got 11.9 percent there. That's still higher than in the least deprived area when you get to year six, right? Now, to me, that seems like quite significant, really, that you have those six year gap, in that six years, the people who are living in the, in the most, uh, uh, most affluent area still have only caught up with the people living in the most deprived areas six years before them, right? And then by the end, when you're looking at year six there, you've essentially got a quarter of that population who are, who are obese. So that's the reality of it, okay? So social disadvantage clearly inhibits people's capacity to live what we would call a healthy lifestyle. This is why uh, the prominent epidemiologist, uh, Michael Marmot, wants us to focus on what he calls the causes of causes, or what uh, Rose called the causes of causes of ill health. What he means by this is that while lifestyle factors like inactivity may be considered causes of ill health, what are the causes of those causes? So, for instance, if we all know that being physically active is good for our health, why don't we all follow that? Um, so looking at these social gradients, as a social scientist, the answer seems obvious. Social inequalities are key. Um, in all my time researching these issues, working with people who live in some of the most deprived areas of England and Scotland, I've never met anyone who didn't know that eating fruit and vegetables and exercising was good for them. I did, however, meet lots of people who found it difficult to live, a li live this lifestyle because of their social circumstances. Simply telling people to eat well and move more won't prevent obesity because it doesn't deal with the root causes. It it's a bit like this. You can use water to put out fire, but fires are not caused by a lack of water. And I know you agree with this logic. It's the reason why when you left your house this morning, you didn't turn around and hose it down in the hope that it wouldn't be on fire when you got home because you appreciated, one, that's over the top, and two, if you do that enough times, your house will fall down irrespective of whether there was a fire or not. It has its own set of problems. Um, so if we're serious about reducing obesity, we need to tackle the inequalities that are driving it. But we don't do that. Instead, we say, isn't it strange that all of these poorer people make terrible decisions and all of these richer people make excellent decisions? Um, by, by addressing obesity in this way, public health blames the victim, essentially. It's cheaper to stigmatise people who are overweight or obese than it is to address the predictable outcomes of social inequality. And I want to stress that this is predictable outcomes. We've got centuries of scientific evidence linking the, uh, the social conditions that people live in and health, right? We know this is all predictable. It's all predictable, and yet we're still here in 2018 doing things uh, that basically are sticking plasters on much bigger issues. So a better approach would be support, not stigma. We need to approach obesity as a social issue rather than a personal failing. Uh, until we do this, not only are we missing the point, but we're making more problems for ourselves. And this is actually what the Weight of Expectation comic is all about. So 
It's based on a year that I spent uh, with three weight loss groups uh, in one of the most deprived uh, areas in, in the UK. Now, these groups met at a local leisure centre that was built as part of a 10-year um, funded intervention to try and improve health in some of the most deprived areas in the UK. For those of you who are familiar with it, it was a new labour initiative where they focused on what were not particularly nicely labelled sort of ill health black spots. But, but the idea was the interventions would be a, a 10 year programme where you, they would try and focus on the social determinants of health to improve health, so rather than focusing on the individual, focusing on those social causes. And I went in after that intervention and was looking at what had happened. Now, one of the things that had been set up, irrespective of the fact that it wasn't to focus on lifestyle, was weight loss groups. Um, and there was three of them. Two of them were, uh, were exclusively female and one of them was exclusively male. Now, we can save discussions about how I was able to, let's say, infiltrate uh, exclusively female, uh, two exclusively female weight loss groups to the, to the pub. Uh, it's, they're good stories um, and I've done far more Zumba than any 31-year-old man should have done. But I was able to and it was not problematic. I can talk to you about that afterwards but they they met up uh, on a weekly basis and there, there were 90 minute sessions there was half an hour where they would get weighed it was uh, sort of semi-public as in they were all in a room and they would get weighed and it, their weight would be recorded so the focus was on losing weight um, and then they would have an hour of physical activity so they'd go and do physical activity and you could see this playing out in in the uh, in the comic um, so, as you've seen from the social gradients that I've already presented, um, the people who live in less affluent areas are disproportionately disadvantaged by inequality and obesity. So, predictably, I was interested in finding out about how this affected their lives. And I learned a lot from these groups. Um, it was clear that they were all forced to negotiate obesity stigma in their everyday lives, and that being stigmatised actually made it more difficult for them to lose weight. Um, this is what pretty much all of the research on obesity stigma shows, not only does stigma not promote weight loss, but it actually promotes weight gain, for instance, through uh, things like comfort eating and exercise avoidance. So through comfort eating, we know that when people are in positions of stress, that will cause some people to reach for sort of coping strategies. And one of those, the most readily available things tends to be things that also make you put on weight. Exercise avoidance, uh, there's a really good illustration of this here. Like, it's always seemed particularly cruel to me um, and counterproductive that we stigmatise bigger bodies and then promote swimming as one of the best ways for people to lose weight because it's non-weight bearing, right? So we create a situation where people are made to feel grotesque in their bodies and that they have something to be ashamed of and then we expect them to get half naked and go to a public forum and think that that's just going to be unproblematic and easy and that anyone should be able to overcome that. Um, and it's this page actually which most people have connected to uh, and connected to it in the most emotive ways through the comic. This is the page that people often come and talk to me about. This is the page that people want to share their experiences about with me. Um, and the part of my research that I want to focus on with you today is not what obesity stigma made people do or not do, so whether they comfort ate or whether they were physically active, but rather how it got under their skin. Um, so because obesity is framed as a personal failing that places an unnecessary um, financial burden on the NHS, the behaviours associated with weight gain are also moralised. People don't just talk about being healthy or unhealthy, people talk about being good or bad. Um, what I found working with the weight loss groups was that the stigma attached to these bad behaviours, or so-called bad behaviours, gets under the skin and is felt in the flesh. Now, let me explain what I mean by this. So, bearing in mind, I went to three weight loss groups uh, a week for a year. Um, that's like, what's that? And, and, and it had about maybe 20 people would be in each of those weight loss groups, so that's 60 people a week, seeing 60 people get weighed. 52 times, like I've seen a lot of people get weighed, I've seen a lot of how people engage with that as a social encounter, how people engage with that as a personal encounter, like I've seen a lot of that. And what happened all the time, pretty much every single weight loss group I went to, what would happen is people would come in 
and before they've got weighed, they would say, I know I've put weight on this week. And they wouldn't just say this as a, like a cognitive thing, right? They would say, I feel fatter, I feel, I feel bigger. People would talk about my trousers feel bigger, like I feel like I'm pushing against the buttons on my clothes, I feel uh, bigger within my own clothing, I just feel bigger. Some people would talk about being able to see that they, they were bigger, that their stomachs were bigger, that their bodies looked different. But all the time they were wrong, not all the time, almost always they were wrong. They would get on the scales and they would find out that they had either stayed the same or lost weight. And they couldn't understand this because they had the experience of, they knew, they actually knew that they were bigger. They could feel it, their clothes felt tighter. They just knew that they had. And then they turned out, it turned out that they hadn't. Um, now, this happened every single week in, in all the groups with different people. Now, this is what I call the weight of expectation. Um, if group members engage, how I try to explain it is that if group members engaged in so-called bad behaviours, uh, they came to internalise the stigma that was associated with those behaviours, um, to feel a sense of guilt that manifests itself in the f as a feeling in their body. Even if they had not put on weight, they felt the gravity of their actions. They expected their bad behaviour to lead to weight gain. And this ex expectation made them feel heavier, even if they hadn't put on weight. Hence why I describe it as the weight of expectation. Now, this might seem far-fetched to you, because we tend to think about mind and body as being separate. You can see this in the way that we talk about physical and mental health. Um, and this has a long philosophical tradition, what we'd call Cartesian dualism. Um, by the way, if you've, had, if you've been a philosopher and you've had like an impact for over like a hundred years, like that's kind of good, but it's also set us back. So Descartes had one of the most, or has one of the most known expressions, right? It's, it's right up there with like Shakespeare's um, to be or not to be, like I think, therefore I am. Now I think this is one of the most un misunderstood expressions in, in, in English culture. I think most people think what it means is that I think, therefore I am clever like it's considered like I'm a thinker right that you think it's about something like it's, it's an it seems like an educated thing like I think that, that the it's about me as a person who thinks what it actually was is it's an existential it's an answer to an existential question that Descartes looking at he's trying to figure out how do we know that we exist right like how so how do we know that we exist how do we know that we're not for instance just a figment of a dream right now Descartes trying to explain this, like, and if you think about it, if you go through the logical things, right, how, how do I know that I'm just not in somebody's dream? So, well, you go, well, I, I can touch someone. Well, you can touch someone in a dream. Like, we've all had dreams, and they're incredibly real. Like, I've had that dream where I've won a million pounds, and I was still not conscious, and then, you know, that bit where you sort of come into sort of that half consciousness, and, you, like, you have to choose whether you're going to wake up from whether you wanted to be in that reality or not. So that thing of I can touch someone, well, you could do that in a dream. Well, I can have a conversation with someone, you can do that in a dream. So Descartes trying to find out, like, how do I know that we're not just in somebody else's dream, right? How, how do I know that that's not the case? And his solution to that is saying, well, I, I can think. And no one could have control over that. No one could control my thoughts. These are personal to me. Therefore, if I think... I must exist, even if it's not in the physical world, I must exist, I exist, my consciousness exists. Now, that's great, it answers a sort of a philosophical conundrum in one way, but what it's also then led to is an elevation of mind over body. We tend to think that the mind is like the captain of the ship, the sort of, this is just like rag and bone, isn't it? And this is the, this is the smart one, this is the thing that does everything. Um, but, the evidence demonstrates that our health, the health of our minds and our bodies are entirely interconnected. And we're getting more and more evidence that, that, that links these two things together. So most of you already believe the logic of this theory anyway. So if you think about like the businesswoman or the businessman in a really stressful job and the idea that they would have a, a higher risk of having a heart attack, we all sort of buy that. We think that that works. So think about something like um, a, the placebo effect. We have scientific evidence to show that the placebo effect is real, right? So that's a thing where the placebo is like something that isn't real, but it has a physical um, encounter. 
And then something like embarrassment. Think about embarrassment. Embarrassment is an entirely socially constructed emotion, right? What embarrasses me won't embarrass you, and what embarrasses you wouldn't necessarily embarrass me. And yet the response to um, that socially constructed emotion is physical. You feel red in your face. You start to sweat, right? You Do you have that? Sometimes when you walk and you remember a thing that was embarrassing that you did about 10 years ago, and you sort of like you get tenser and you get smaller. Like, there is a physical reaction. So in all of those examples, these are social things. These are things that sort of could be different. We could understand them differently, but these are sort of out in the ether, and yet they get under the skin and have an impact on your body. They have a physical impact. So that's the same theory that's behind this idea of the weight of expectation. Um, so just as in these examples... It's a, it's a type of psychosomatic stress, a type of mind-body stress, basically. And my argument is it's a, it's a reaction to obesity stigma. And what's really interesting is that research published only last month shows uh, showed that people who experience obesity stigma um, have higher levels of, cortis uh, of a hormone called cortisol. So cortisol is known as a stress hormone. At times of stress, um, we, uh, our body releases it. Um, it's also related to fat storage. So it's, apparently it has a sort of evolutionary design that when previously when we, it, we, when we experienced stress, that would have been in times of like starvation. So this hormone came out, so it would store any food that we did have, it would store as fat so that we could survive, basically. It's a hormone that, you know, it doesn't really work now in the modern time when we don't, in Western societies for, for, for the main part, don't have this famine anymore. Um, and what's really interesting, they, they can measure uh, cortisol in hair. They can take hair samples. It's kind of like the rings in a tree trunk where they can say, this is about how long a month is. Therefore, we can see that you are more stressed. There's more, there's a component of uh, cortisol in your hair at this point. So this is an example of how obesity stigma gets under the skin. And it makes me suspect that cortisol is likely to be involved in the feeling that I describe as the weight of expectation. But obviously, need to do more research on that, which is what researchers say because they need to stay in a job. Um, and we do know for sure, though, that cortisol encourages fat storage, uh, which, of course, indicates that obesity stigma is counterproductive. Um, what was clear in the weight loss groups that I observed was that the weight of expectation made people's bodies less knowable to them um, and was emotionally draining. This didn't promote weight loss. Most of the group members maintained a relatively stable overweight, uh, a weight that was outside of the healthy BMI zone. Instead, of being, uh, in, instead, being stigmatized just gave group members one more thing to worry about, one more thing to deal with, and weighed, made weight management far more unpredictable and challenging. And if you talk to people who are involved in weight management, one of the things they will tell you is that absolutely essential is having, sort of having a real awareness of your body and sort of knowing your body and not so this idea of confusing your objective and your subjective experience of your body would be problematic. Um, what was also interesting in the weight loss groups was how group members would use physical activity as a way to combat this stigma and the uncertainty it created. Physic physical activity is moralised as a, as a good behaviour, but this wasn't always enough to make uh, the group members feel um, good about themselves. Um, they needed physical evidence of this. So very often in the groups they would talk about, and this was something that the men and women would say, that I want to get a sweat on, we need to get a sweat on. They would want to see sweat, they would want to experience sweat, they would, and lots of it as well. They would want lots of sweat. So there was lots of uh, efforts to increase the amount of sweat that they would have. They would talk about activities that were good, good, good uh, but bad but good. And what they meant by that is things that were difficult and they were hard and they sort of were like weren't that pleasant to do but they gave you physical evidence so one through sweating but they would also talk about uh, delayed onset muscles uh, soreness which in sort of uh, academia or in sort of my uh, research background that's called DOMS so when I told the illustrator about DOMS this is why we ended up with uh, this this picture here this is that's what you get with interdisciplinary uh, working is a uh, sexualized muscle soreness. Um, so 
what is interesting, though, is that they, they needed this physical evidence. It wasn't enough, right, for them to have just been physically active. They needed to have the evidence of the, the sweat on the skin, the, 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 the pain in their body, the, the ache and pain in their body. And my interpretation of this is it was to deal with the unpredictability of weight management and to help them negotiate their stigmatised physical form. The sweat and the aching muscles provided evidence for themselves and others of the effort that they were assumed to have shirked. Now, a really good example of this is, it, again, it always seems incredibly unfair to me that these uh, uh, men and women, so these were people who were often considered to be lazy, irresponsible people because of their physical form. And yet I'd see them go in these groups, and at the time there was a sort of exercise fad that doing high intensity exercise would help you lose weight. So really, really intense stuff. The sort of stuff that, you know, Andrew Marr had a stroke, he was doing that exercise fad because of this called uh, HIIT training. Now, they would do versions of this in these groups. So we're talking about people doing incredibly high intense stuff. Uh, and I should say at this point, I was doing all of it with them because they said, it'd be weird if you just watched us sweat, you have to do it with us. So I'd watch them do this, like incredibly effortful, being like sweating, big red faces, uh, and really, really sort of like grimacing faces. And then they could go and have a shower and then walk out into the car park and someone could still shout fat lazy bitch or fat bitch at these people because their physical form had already, we'd, as a culture, we'd already decided what that tells us. And it's divorced from the activities of what these people are doing. And I thought that that was incredibly unfair. And it also made me think about how that must be difficult to maintain over a long period of time. If you're not really losing weight, but you're being physically active over a long period of time, if, if your, what you're doing isn't recognised and isn't seen, then that's going to be difficult to maintain over a long period of time. So physical activity fell into the shadow of weight loss, and it makes me wonder how much more positive and enjoyable might the experience of physical activity be if it wasn't primarily engaged with as a way to lose weight and negotiate obesity stigma. So the fat but fit obesity paradox indicates that Health at every size is not only possible, but it's far more achievable than attempting to get everyone to conform with the so-called healthy obesity, uh, healthy BMI, sorry. Now, I would argue that it's time to start acting on the evidence instead of approaching obesity uh, as we always have done. So to finish up then, what I would say is sort of like some concluding comments is that we need to recognise and be honest about all the evidence that shows BMI is a crude indicator of health um, that has created an unhelpful fo focus on weight and weight loss. Uh, we need to reject the individualisation of social issues and the tendency to blame the victim. We need to act on evidence that shows eating a healthy diet and being physically active are to a large extent socially determined. And so what is required is social and environmental intervention to make healthy choices, easy choices for everyone. We need to see obesity stigma for what it is, unfair and, and, and counterproductive. In short, if we're interested in promoting health, people need support, not stigma, which is where we end up at the end of the comic. Um, so yeah, just to say thank you uh, in particular to Jade, who drew the comic for us, and to invite any of you to ask any questions that you may have about the work, about the comic in particular, um, and how that work translates into the comic and what we're trying to do to help promote health through it. Thank you. Have you experienced a lot of pushback from people about this idea that uh, this whole individual responsibility for obesity and how it's, we shouldn't be uh, blaming, the, blaming the individual for their, for their weight, for example? Um, y yes, and as in, I think it's, people consider that to be common sense, so it's quite, it's interesting that um, when you start to challenge it, people want to know why. Um, that poster was one of the artworks that we have, but we have a series of everyone's, and normally that's... I found it is once you start dealing with common sense by also going, but 
if you're only looking at it within an individual framework, you need to see it in a, in a bigger context. People, so they have challenged, but I have normally been able to bring them round the other way. Um, but I think that, that the, one of the biggest issues that we are facing and why this work is like, this will be a lifetime's work, is because that's so cemented in our understanding, right? That that, that is true, that it is just about individual um, choices. And it's one of the reasons why, so we did want to put this comic in schools, uh, but and I think that that's a really useful thing to do, but we haven't been able to because uh, there's some swearing in it. So schools who are like petrified that parents would complain that, that their kid got this comic that's got swearing in it. So we've just got funding to, to take all the swear. So we'll have a swear-free version to put into schools. Um, and what's really interesting, actually, doing the sort of research for that, to so what age are we going to go to, in the, really, in the younger schools, in primary schools, the, the, the kids didn't even know what obesity was. They didn't, a lot of them didn't know that term, and they didn't understand the logic of, of the comic, right? They understood that fat people get taken like the piss out of. They understood that as a concept, but they saw it as unfair. But as you go a bit older, then these things are cemented in these things. So it's almost too late, you know, to sort of be talking to adults because they have really cemented ideas. I do think that one of the problems, though, with this is that people can just make a name for themselves, can't they? It's like in, in sort of... It's, obesity is a media issue as well, and so if you want to get on television, you can talk about... Like, so Katie Hopkins, for instance, uh, did us all a favour, of course, of demonstrating that a privileged white woman can put on weight and then lose weight. Miraculous. I didn't know that we could, that we could realise that without her having demonstrated it to us. Um, and, and, but the fact that that show can even get commissioned and, and go on, it, it really demonstrates the lack of understanding. Because, you know, like, how is that useful? We've known for years and years and years and years that middle class people can put on weight and lose it, right? Like, that's, not, that's not finding that the actual bigger issue is that there are a whole swathe of people who struggle to um, live healthy lifestyles because of the conditions that they're in. It's not, but the reason why that programme is made is because that, it is cemented, that idea that it's an individual issue. And yeah, so on Twitter I get a lot of people, particularly uh, the pushback is, is that predictably so. Uh, so I'm told we have time. Uh, thanks so much. It's a, it's, a great, uh, it's a great lecture. So one of the things, just for your comment really, because you, you probably haven't missed um, the, um, um, the fact that Grimsby um, uh, was uh, deemed to be the, the unhealthiest uh, high street in, in, in the UK, I think, a few yeah. days ago. And it, there's an interesting, there's a whole uh, new, in inverted commas, because it isn't really new, approach to public health through this sort of, um, the nudge concept and, and yes. the nudge unit that, that was within the cabinet. Nudge then, economics, yeah. Well, exactly. So, which in some ways may be compounding the issue of individual choice, it's just be, people being silly enough not to make right choices, so therefore you, cha you change the so-called choice architecture, mm. and therefore they're going to do the right thing. So where does that fit in... in in your thinking, if you like, and how do we converse with, with that approach, which seems to be gaining some traction within public health in the yeah. last sort of 10 years? See, I, this is the thing, and I suppose that this is where I am different to some people who might I, identify themselves as uh, fat activists. So, absolutely, I should say right off the bat, I don't think any, I don't think um, people should be defined by their body type, I think, and, and particularly linking body types to morality is, is a moronic thing to do. Um, but I'm not someone who, so, so my work more predominantly and some of the, I, well, the talk I was going to give actually was about um, inequality and how we address uh, health inequalities. There is a concept within that called lifestyle drift. And so what it is, is the reason, one of the reasons why we still have these massive gaps in life expectancy is because even now, even though we now have, so like the Black Report, which came out in the 1980s that showed that there are these huge, they called variances in, in health at that point in time. Um, demonstrating this got hidden by a political agenda that didn't want to acknowledge that. Um, and so we, we have the evidence, but we don't act on it. And one of the reasons we don't is so policies start off saying, OK, we're going to act on the social determinants of health. And then they drift down, 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 down towards lifestyle and the individual. So very often in my line of work, lifestyle is seen as the enemy. So if you talk about physical activity, if you talk about diet, you're on the wrong side of the 
of the fence, right? You're on the wrong, well, or wrong side of the war to be more apt. Now, my background, I should, I'll expose myself here and you can all feel much better about who you are in comparison to me. I did sports science as a degree. Um, so, yeah, my background was like I came through like physical activity and like I'm not evangelical about it at all. Like I look at the evidence and, and see it for, for what it is. Um, but also working in these communities, these aren't, when you go into these communities, we've created this uh, infrastructure where we've told people that a healthy lifestyle is the way that you're going to live longer. And yet our economic system excludes some people from being able to afford that lifestyle or to live that lifestyle and it affords other people to do it. So if you don't do anything to do with lifestyle, you leave those people to just have the anxiety, the fear, all of that that goes with labelling those people as risky and likely to die, right? Or likely to die earlier than they should. So I think lifestyle has to be part of these bigger things, but you have to recognise it as something that is socially driven, right? So it's about how do you change the material infrastructure. So the research on it shows that in deprived areas, you're far less likely to have green spaces, you're far less likely to have... Um, physical activity facilities like leisure centres, swimming pools, those sorts of things, than you are on others. So I don't think it's problematic to go, well, we need to equal that out, actually. We need to put more swimming pools in poorer areas so that that's an actual choice that people might have to make. I don't think that's problematic. I think it's something that we need to do. Because if we had a revolution tomorrow, we would still have these inequalities because at that point, lifestyle would start would be the determining factor wasn't it if we if we zero summed it and everyone got paid the same amount tomorrow there would still be some people that didn't have access to healthy f uh food of uh cheap healthy food uh and physical activity uh, facilities so i think that lifestyle does have a pl uh, place the nudge economics though is different it's difficult because it is still a individually focused isn't it it's still about but how can we make this person make a different decision and actually, it's really interesting with the Grimsby one. I saw a, a, a tweet that underneath it still had people just going, but that's because they go to Starbucks and Starbucks and drink sugary drinks. It's like, how, how can you un misunderstand this like, issue so much that you think Grimsby, a place that's had all industry taken out of it, like it's like a place that's sort of down on it, because you know, a fishing, port, like a fishing industry was a re a really difficult, in a difficult state. And yet you go, oh, it's, but it's still because people go to Starbucks and drink uh, cups of coffee that have like 10 spoons of sugar in it. It's like, that's why we can't resolve this issue. And we're not going to resolve it by going, but with nudge economics, we can make them not drink that cup of coffee. You know? So I think, so my point is that nudge economics isn't the answer, but I think that also the answer isn't excluding lifestyle from any intervention where we address inequalities. I think that we have to see it. Like, that does inform, but it does change people's life expectancy. It will do, but we have to recognise that those things are driven by social factors. I hope that answers that.